Hello ladies and gentlemen, today is another one of those videos. What do I mean by those videos? Well, we're not going to look at just one game today, but we are going to look at a compilation of games in uh, rapid succession. It's going to be fast and fun. And today we are looking at um, uh, Magnus Carlsen's games uh, in the Alakine defense. And that's right. This is... Uh, a compilation video of Magnus Carlsen, uh, world champion, playing the black pieces with the Alicon defense. Uh, unfortunately, there are not a lot of classical games in the Alicon defense. And those of you who have been playing chess a long time uh, would know that the Alicon defense doesn't have the uh, uh, highest respect of the elite uh, grandmasters that say the uh, Queen's Gambit uh, decline or uh, Grunfeld or, or something uh, like that. That doesn't necessarily mean the opening is bad. It just means that at this moment in time, it just doesn't um, have that stamp of approval by the elite. Often, it would take a very strong grandmaster who takes a liking to an opening and uh, finds some type of nuance in it and, uh, or a famous game rather and brings it uh, back uh, to respectability. Um, but um, Alicon Defense is one of those uh, openings that's very popular <clears throat> at the lower levels. And, um, and I personally uh, enjoy playing it. Uh, uh, it allows you to take control of the opening um, Maybe take control is a bad word, but it allows you to steer the opening into channels that you are familiar with uh, right from the start. Uh, as soon as you play uh, Knight of Six after E4, um, the opponent is basically forced into your game, whether uh, he likes it uh, or not. Um, what can I say about Alicon's defense uh, that you might not know? Well, Alicon's defense, of course... Even though it's named after for, former world champion Alexander uh, Alakon, of course, he wasn't the first uh, to play it. But um, he, uh, being the caliber of, of player that he was, put it on the map against a, a player named Steiner uh, in 1921, if I'm correct, at Budapest. All right, so after Alakon won with the black pieces, of course, all the hypermodern players, um, you know, jumped on board. And um, it was a spike in popularity of that opening. And then uh, a few years later, Emmanuel Lasker used it to uh, defeat Maroxi in the uh, uh, New York uh, 1924 uh, tournament. So that really uh, solidified it as an opening uh, that top players would use. But um, although there was, uh, you know, there were those great successes, Alicon defense never really... Um, had the respect of the Sicilian or say the Rui Lopez, all right. And I I think the the reason is pretty simple. Um, it's very risky. Um, you're provoking White to advance this huge center, right? You're losing uh time by uh moving the knight around, right? As it's it's attacked, and okay, as a result of this strategy, Black does have targets to attack. And white center may become overextended and collapse. But if white is not too um, uh, ambitious, right, and uh, doesn't get careless, hey, he can maintain the advantage, right, the long-term advantage with, uh, you know, with his extra space that he's acquired and his uh, mobility as a result. Okay, so... That's basically the, the uh, if you want to say the proverbial knock on the Alicon's defense is that there are effective ways that have been developed by White over the years in order to uh, deal uh, with this defense. And what's interesting is the, the, um, the attacks by White that are most effective are those attacks that uh, are the most restrained, those classical openings. Not necessarily the four pawns attack or the chase variation, but... Just your uh, simple classical uh, variations like the exchange variation or uh, just a simple uh, modern variation that gives uh, Alicon players the most uh, trouble. Um, but if you are interested in the studying the black side of the Alicon's defense, uh, Grandmaster Lev Albert uh, is uh, retired, of course, now, but uh, he was basically a champion for 
the Alakine's defense for a few decades. All right, so there's many, many games left Albert. Uh, win or lose, he championed the defense. He played it uh, all the time at a grandmaster uh, level. Matter of fact, there's a um, not-so-famous match um, <clears throat> between Lev Albert and Nigel Short that took place in the 80s where all of uh, the games where uh, Lev Albert had black, he played uh, Alakon defense. And um, I have a video compilation of that be called uh, when... Uh, uh, Alakine's defense expert meets Alakine destroyer. So you can check out the games uh, from that match. Okay, and uh, today there's a few grandmasters in the 2600 range that uh, played uh, Alakine's uh, defense. But right now, let's get into um, uh, Magnus Carlsen and his use of the Alakine uh, defense here. So the first game I'm going to start out with is um in 2003 this is before he became a grandmaster but magnus carlson is black uh rated about 2400 around this time and he's playing against grandmaster uh emil satovsky with the white pieces the game started out as you can see e4 uh knight of six e5 knight d5 d4 d6 knight of three d takes e5 knight takes e5 and c6 now C6 looks like a funny move to the uh, uninformed or uninitiated because it seems that uh, White can just simply play C4, right, and gain more space. After all, he would love that move. However, the idea behind um, C6 is that after C4, one of the major ideas is that after C4, White will play, excuse me, Black will play this move, Knight B3. And... Let's say if a naive move is played, a3, then black has this nice tactic. Uh, queen takes d4, attacking this a vulnerable knight here. And of course, if queen takes queen, then you have the old-fashioned fork. Knight c2 check. King must move to d1 or a d2, and then knight takes d4 here. And black uh, has not only uh, won a pawn, but is also... Uh, upset the right of white to castle here. So this is just better uh, for black. This is why after c6 you see moves like bishop e2 played or bishop d3. <clears throat> and not uh, c6 right away. Also this move uh, gives black's king an outlet. In certain variations where this sacrifice would be made but we're not getting into the theory of the Alakines right now, but I just wanted to tell you about this move, c6. So moving on, bishop d3 was played, knight d7 by Carlson. And this is what I'm talking about with this sacrifice. If this pawn is here, um, there's variations where white would play the sacrifice on f7. Okay, and, uh, you know, it's very, uh, very unbalanced uh, position uh, here. And Black's king gets chased around the board. So c6 gives that outlet. Game continued. Castle. Knight takes e5. D takes e5. Knight b4 by Magnus. Wanting to secure the bishop pair. And trade queens if he can. And so he trades queens. Rook takes d1. So you might say, hey, white... Um, you know, what does white really have? Well, white has a nice space advantage here. Okay, and so this is a dangerous position. Um, black has to be careful um, with white space advantage and um, his early possession of the D file here. This move F5, little suspect. It's simply A3. Knight A6, and now Bishop F3. G6, Knight D2, Bishop E6 here, Bishop E2, and now the position is, is not too bad for Magnus, I mean he could just castle Queen side here if he wants to so play Bishop G7, instead he plays Knight C7, Knight F3, and now Bishop D5, Knight D4, here's Bishop G7, C4, Bishop f7, and now f4 is played. Knight e6, knight f3, avoiding 
uh, this trade. As black is a little cramped. Rook d8. Bishop e3. Castle. And again, it's not a huge advantage for uh, white here. But black's piece is a, a little awkward. And white has this nice uh, space here. B4 is played. If bishop takes a7, then just simply knight takes uh, f4. So the bishop stays put in order to keep an eye on this f pawn. Instead, more space is gained with b4. a6, uh, this move is a little suspicious too, weakening the dark squares on the queen side. Perhaps b6 is a little better. Sorry about that. A6 instead. And now G3. So you can see that Magnus wanted to deal with this weakness right here. But perhaps B6 was a little better. Instead of um, weakening the uh, B6 square. Rook takes D1. Rook takes D1. Rook D8. Rooks come off. And now we can see that white. This has a nice solid advantage going into the end game. And here he's preparing the advance b5. Bishop e8. Notice this dark square. Bishop is dead. Knight comes to b3. And that knight is on its way to c5 to put pressure here and here on these light squares. Bishop to d7. Knight c5, bishop c8 now. Here's the break. b5, a takes, c takes, c takes. And now bishop takes b5. Bishop f8. Desperately trying to get that dark square bishop in the game. It's as if our black is playing a piece down. King f2. Now the king starts coming up the board. King g7, knight d7. King to f7. a4. Bishop d7. What else is Magnus going to do here? Bishop takes d7. e6. Finally, the bishop sees some kind of daylight, but it's a little bit too late. Bishop b6. And now what happens here is that this pawn is blockaded on b7. And now white simply threatens to play um, ideas like bishop to c7 and uh, capture this pawn. Or capture the knight first, followed by the capture of the pawn. Bishop e7. Note also how this king is um, forced to stay close to uh, the e6 square because these pawns are all on light squares. a5. g5 trying to break out. Of course, uh, Satovsky ignores king e2, h5, and now bishop c8, h4, and now a good ending here. Bishop takes b7. He doesn't even play bishop, you know... Uh, a move like this first. Bishop takes d8. Bishop d8, which would give Magnus what he's looking for. After all, this pawn would be attacked. And after bishop takes b7, bishop takes a5, we can all shake hands and go home. Instead, after bishop c8, h4, bishop takes b7. Why? Because the knight is not good at stopping outside passers. The knight takes b7, just simply a6, and there's really no proper way to uh, stop the a pawn from advancing. So, uh, nice, solid game uh, by a Grandmaster Satovsky, just using his uh, superior experience at the time. And, uh, you know, obviously, being a stronger player, he was able to overcome the young uh, Magnus uh, Carlson, who I think was about 14 years old at the time. All right, so now the next game moving on is when Magnus Carlsen is now a young grandmaster. And this is actually a classical game. Um, <clears throat> uh, the white player is uh, Haba at 25-25 at the time. And Magnus Carlsen has the black pieces. Uh, is rated 27-14. This game took place in um, April of 2007. Again, from our starting position with E5 played. And note too, I've avoided transpositions, for for example, so you won't see any games e4, knight f6, knight c3, for example, where, um, you know, white kind of builds out. 
or e4 knight f6 d3 uh, etc so these are games where white has accepted the gauntlet uh, or the challenge thrown down by black and uh, has played the strongest move available which is e5 <clears throat> so against Haba we see d4 d6 knight f3 here again this exchange of this modern variation knight takes e5 and we see c6 again for Magnus which we explained earlier there's bishop c4 and now you see knight d7 with this uh, instant challenge to the e5 uh, square knight takes bishop d7 queen f3 e6 castles and of course now black has to deal with the uh, this bishop well, he will in time. Queen f6. And we see black just um, easily uh, equalize the position. He plays c5. Notice now the resemblance of the position to, say, uh, like a queen's pawn game or something like that. This is um, just a quick side note. This is why it's important for you to learn about structures in chess and not necessarily focus too much on openings. Because if you learn your structures, then you realize that this is a Carol Slav structure. And you realize the plans immediately that you want to play a move like C5 or E5 if you can get it. But most of the time, C5 is the easier break to get is black. But if you recognize, hey, this is a Carol Slav structure or I'm shooting for that structure, you play accordingly. Okay, so no matter what the opening was, this opening could have been, you know, from a uh, Queen's Pawn opening. But... And, trans and and still got the same position. Alright. So it's the structure that's very important. That's going to dictate your strategy here. Back to the game. At the knight d2. You have c5. Takes. And black is absolutely uh, equal right here. And um, just went on uh, to draw this game. I'm not even going to show the whole uh, game. Equal position. Pieces were traded off, and uh, as you can see, Black did a great job uh, equalizing uh, the position. All right, so he did good in the classical game. The next time we saw the appearance of the Alakan defense is um in November of 2007 so a few months later uh this is uh from the World Blitz tournament in Moscow so we can't take the game too serious but again even uh grandmaster games um can produce high quality uh games even that faster time controls and here with the white pieces we have uh Vichy Anand in 2007 at 2800 so Vichy was still right at its peak at that world championship uh, status um, um, and I'm not sure if he was world champion in 2007 or if it was Kramnik I know right, right around that time he was still very strong I should um, have uh, looked that up real quick I just can't remember if he was still champion at this time but he had the white pieces here against Magnus Carlsen again we see the same modern defense and now notice the difference here is that Anand decides to keep the bishop on e2 instead of bringing it to c4. This leaves the option open of playing this move c4. Remember I told you that c4 wasn't really a good move right away. However, that doesn't mean we can't prepare to play it later. And that's one of the ideas behind this move. And this is uh, the strongest move um, in this position. This bishop e2 and just you know going along with the development and then... Um, playing uh, c4 later also another idea behind bishop e2 is to support this pawn advance g4 yeah I know it sounds a little crazy but in many lines black will try to get this bishop out first uh, if you remember the last game the bishop was kind of caught behind the pawn chain and then we had black playing you know bishop e7 and then eventually using his Carol Slav structure and breaking a c5 so sometimes when black wants to come out here, white wants to discover that sometime and play a move like g4 to attack 
uh, that piece. Of course, other alternatives are Knight D7 uh, here, but it, but then you have C4. So it's a bit of a cat and mouse game here. This is a tough line, I uh, believe, for for um, Black in the Alakon's defense. So here, Alec, um, Carlson chooses Bishop F5. There it is, G4, Bishop E6, and now C4, Knight C7. So what does white have here? White has some space uh, advantage here. And um, but in exchange for his, uh, uh, let us say, compromised pawn structure on the king side. But if he's going to attack and blow white off the board, it's really not going to make a difference. So rook g1. And again, this is, is blitz. So we can say for all intents and purposes that yes, black is, is equalized, right? He has uh, you know superior pawn structure, right? But he has to be careful of white's space, which often leads to dynamic opportunity. So Magnus starts dealing with this right away. Knight d7, knight f3, old school chess, right? Avoiding the trades, right? When you have more space in the position, letting your opponent uh, you know, suffer in his cramped uh, position. G6. Right, where else to put the bishop? Knight c3, bishop g7. So Magnus does a good job uh, coordinating and developing his pieces. Right, this is a good position for black. Black has nothing to worry about here at this moment, just for the record. Queen d2, b5. So Magnus uh, decides to start attacking the white center. It's important to loosen up this pawn uh, duo here in the center on d4 and c5. So c takes. C takes B5, Knight takes B5, Knight takes, Bishop takes B5, and now um, Bishop D5 here, blockading uh, the pawn, right? So we can see here, Black's position to me looks a little better because White's early aggressiveness seems to have backfired. He has weak pawns, right, in the G file and the D file, and Black's position looks excellent. Bishop E2, Rook C8. Now knight of six is played, right? Knight e4 is just waiting to be occupied. There it is. Queen b2. Nice move. e6, g5. Queen d6. Only thing black really has to be mindful of is this occupation of these squares with this pawn advanced on g5. Occupation of h6 and g5. H4, so a 9 is committed. Notice too how the rook on the C file kind of makes it difficult for white to get this rook into the game. Because ideally, a 9 would love to have his king on B1 and these rooks over here on the on the king side. Knight C3. Knight takes E2. And again... Black is just better here. But let's see what happened because it is it is blitz game. He played rook c7 here. Um, bishop b7 with the idea of queen d5 is good. So, for example, bishop b7, knight here, and queen d5. A good idea. And then, then um, completing development by bringing the rook here. Magnus plays rook c8, right, normal idea to just double up, right, after all, double up and uh, win the queen. Rook c1, of course, check, king e1, rook fc8, rook takes, now nine starts to create some um, threats here. And Magnus starts losing the thread of the position. Remember, I warned you earlier about these these squares. Bishop b4 check. Bishop d2. Of course, Anand doesn't mind trading the uh, dark square bishops off. Rook c3. Bishop d2. Now knight e3. Bishop f3. Knight c4. And so Anand has reached his goal. He has traded the dark square bishops off. Rook takes c7. Queen takes c7. And now queen a3. 
and black has to be very careful seeing that black still has a dark squared bishop both kings are exposed and now it's pretty much like a free for all and who's going to make the first mistake god only knows what the time situation was like by this time black uh had lost the thread of the position you can see he's down some material here but like I said before, it's just a blitz game. And eventually Anand was able to secure the victory. And he does it right on those dark squares. I'm playing queen c5 check. And um, Magnus was forced to resign because the material advantage is going to be uh, too steep after the uh, queens come off the board. Okay. So although... Carlson lost that game to again a world championship um world championship player in the nine uh who was about ninety points uh higher in rating than he was. He was able to secure uh equal position uh from the Alicon uh defense. Right? This position is good uh good for black here. Moving on. Another killer. You're talking about Going from killer to killer. Now he has to play uh, Vasily Vanchuk. This is the same Blitz tournament. Magnus calls him the black pieces again. Ma wow, imagine playing Anand and Ivanchuk back to back. That's that's sick. Knight D4, D4. Um, nah, Knight D5, D4, D6. And C4. And so here you have this classic exchange variation. Of course... Black can take with the C pawn, right? Leading to some different positions. Um, the the um, this variation is a little bit more solid, but you have less uh, dynamic possibilities. So that's the trade off. If you want to play kind of safe, you play this way. If you want some more um, um, imbalances in the position, you take with the C pawn. Knight C three. All right, back again. Sorry about that. I had to take that phone call. Kind of lost my uh, train of thought here. So um, picking up here when it, it, we're in this exchange variation of the Alicon's defense. And <clears throat> again, another point I did want to make is that these are the type types of variations, right, to play as white, right, that uh, in my opinion give white... Uh, uh, excuse me, give black the most uh, difficulty. These simple variations where white doesn't try to uh, go for much, right? He doesn't try to blow uh, white, black off the board, but he just simply takes the space, right? And he solidifies his hold on the center and he kind of slowly squeezes uh, uh, black, in the positions, right? It's not the the big exaggerated attacks like the four pawns attack or chase variations where he's just uh, <clears throat> just going absolutely berserk. This is what um, Black would want, okay? And these are the types of systems that um, uh, make the Alakine's defense effective. Is when White is overreaching and overextending, but when White plays conservatively like this, it's very hard. Um, uh, for black. So the game continued with Magnus Carlsen. Bishop e7. Avanchuk played bishop d3. Notice the solidity of the position. Knight c6. Knight g e2. Again here's another dangerous variation. Uh, for for black. It has a good reputation. The knight coming to d2 here. Again. Leaves this idea of bishop g4. Uh, just standing. Uh. Uh, you know, on a, a empty road, so to speak, right? If the knight came to f3, then we can see this benefit of pinning with g4. However, if now a move like bishop g4, it could be met easily by f3 followed by a pawn storm, uh, especially after kingside castling. So this forces white, excuse me, black to try to do something else with this bishop. Game continues, bishop f6. Right, putting extra pressure on the pawn. Bishop e3. Notice Ivan Tuck could have played d5. Right, but he keeps his position very solid. Bishop e3. Castles. b3. Super solid position. 
Okay, is Black lost? No, but he, it's hard for him to really find any prospects in the position here. Okay, meanwhile, White has the extra space where he can maneuver and continue to build on this position. Rookie 8, Castle. Now he finally acquiesces. Notice after um, White Castles, now he acquiesces to Bishop G4. Because now if a move like F3, we have the um, bishop hanging on E3. And also this bishop can just simply come back here. So now Queen D2. Okay, D5. Striking this in the center. And um, C takes D5. Okay, would be beneficial to black as white ends up with this um, <clears throat> blockaded, isolated pawn scenario uh, here. So C5 is the most uh, common way to go here, uh, taking the space, right? And that's a big theme to Alicon is increasing space. So bishop takes E2 for Magnus. Bishop takes E2. And now knight c8. The idea of knight c8 is that this knight is going to end up on f5. Right here, here, and here. With this attack on this uh, bishop. If knight d7, notice that the pawn on d5 is vulnerable. Again, common theme that you'll see in this defense. Bishop g4. Again, also notice that white now has, has the bishop pair also g6 preparing the doubling of rooks here and again this is a common issue with this defense is that white's uh position is not overwhelming right but he has this, this, this space advantage and he has the two bishops here and black has little prospects of counterattacking due to the uh, symmetry of the position and the basic rule of symmetry uh i've i got this from reading the book the middle game by max Erva, former world champion and he basically says that hey uh in symmetrical positions the game is um going to usually be decided by whoever can get the initiative first in symmetrical positions this this position is not completely symmetrical but it's um uh pretty close to it Okay, so whoever can basically get in control of the open files first, develop, uh, start developing attacks uh, on the um, opponent is going to gain the initiative and usually wind up having an upper hand uh, here. Rook a e1, there's knight f5, bishop gets rid of it. So now we see this compromised king structure. And white. Feeling good about his position, simply just starts trading off. And rook d1, of course, keeping an eye on the uh, uh, e pawn, uh, excuse me, the d pawn. And this knight wants to move up the board. So rook e8, and f3 here, knight e7, now knight g3. Queen to f6, rook e1 by Avanchuk, king f8, and rook e5, very powerful move, uh, paralyzing the um, black pieces, right, in the defense of f5, c6, taking care of the problem with d5, but how do you defend f5, knight h5, by Avanchuk, queen g6, knight f5, a little repetition there, and now queen e3. And again, simple chess. And remember, the position is pretty much symmetrical. So whoever has the initiative is going to usually gain the upper hand. And that's what you see here. White has this pressure on the position. All right? They're both uh, some waiting moves here. And now we see Carlson's kind of reduced to shuffling. Some improvements in position. Again, knight h5, queen g6, and now, again, there's this tactical uh, melee. Rook takes e7, queen takes, pawn drops, rook e8. So, here, Magnus, of course, he saw the pawn being lost. He tries to get dynamic here, and he might have overlooked this shot. Again, it's a blitz game, but if Antuck, 
um, hits with this powerful tactic. If you know, if you can see it, um, you know, pause the video, right? But check it out. Van Chuck right here. Queen takes E8 check. King takes C takes B6. And how are you going to stop that queen from being made B7? F takes G3 check. And of course, he doesn't take King G2 because you have to keep the king protected from checks. And Magnus Carlsen resigns. So beautiful combination right there. Boom. By um, uh, Van Chuck. Perhaps Carlsen was hoping for, you know, some other move. Maybe Queen F4. Right, perhaps. Or maybe, you know, the king just moving out the way. After all, white is still uh, better here. But uh, Van Chuck being the genius that he is just seals the deal with queen takes e8. Understanding that there's no way to stop this pawn. And there's no way for this queen to get around these pawns and check the king. <clears throat> Another killer, the white pieces, British Grandmaster Michael Adams, the white pieces. Again, at the same um, Blitz tournament, round 14, November 21st, 2007. We're going to go rapidly through this one. Again, same variation we see here. This this is known as the modern variation, the Alicons. And again, notice the conservativeness of the white's play here. Again, there's a Carol Slav structure. And here, black is equalized. Um, white has not played aggressively enough to really stop black from doing what he wanted to do. Okay? So perhaps Adams is not really um, too prepared in this opening. And Magnus is just able to equalize equally, uh, equalize equally, equalize easily. And efficiently, again, same idea in the Carol Slav. Notice the C5 pawn break. And basically, once you get that, I mean, it's it's pretty much uh, equal from here, here on out. Okay, and these players eventually uh, wind up agreeing uh, to a draw and you know, move 67. The next game. Round 16 of the same tournament, the World Blitz. You have Alexei Shirov, Mr. Fire on board. <clears throat> uh, rated 2739 at the time. I guess Magnus Carlsen here. Shirov known for his aggressiveness. Again, we see this same line and Bishop C4. Remember I said earlier, I like the move Bishop E2 that Anand played. Okay. With this idea of G4, if this bishop comes out, and also preserving the idea of C4 when it's appropriate. But bishop C4 is an old classical line, which tends to put a lot of pressure on this square. <clears throat> and um, Shirov being a classical and aggressive player, um, I can see why he would choose this kind of line. So here goes knight D7, knight F3. This just conforms to the principle, again, if the player, if you have more space, you want to keep the pieces on the board because this player is cramped. Knight 7, F6, H3, and now Bishop F5. Castles, E6. Again, and you'll see this, hear me repeat this term a lot. Again, you have the Carol Slav structure. What is, basically, I never said what Carol Slav structure is. I'm just assuming, I'm sorry about that. Carol Slav structure means... Um, it's the structure that you will see a lot in the Carol Khan uh, defense and also the Slav uh, defense. I'm not going to get into those right now. I mean, you could look them up and look at the pawn structures, but that's the these are pawn structures that you will see in uh, primarily in those defenses, the Slav defense and the Carol Khan defense. And um, if you want to save time, right, and studying your openings, play openings with similar pawn structures. So if you play the Slav defense against d4, play Karakhan against e4. All right? Now play openings that will lead you to a similar structure so that you'll be familiar with the themes. So here, 
again, black has been allowed to get all his pieces out and whites only Trump in this position really is a space advantage, right? And this uh, pawn preponderance in the center. Again, black's salvation is often going to be C5. Of course, if he can get the E5 break in, that would be great. But the reason why the E5 break is usually so hard is because, again, you have this D pawn here, right? Not only um, inhibiting the advance of the C pawn, it also inhibits the advance of the E pawn. But furthermore, you have the knight here on F3, which also blockades the E5 square. And often you'll get a piece on this uh, semi-open file also uh, hindering the advance of the E pawn. And this is why the C pawn advance is usually the one that is made. Going on, uh, bishop g5, bishop e7, knight d2, h6. So Shirov uh, trades off. c3, again, black is already equalized. This is a you know solid but passive approach by white. So white is not trying to get any advantage. And you see in these games, black, uh, when white doesn't kind of, you know, um, push for an advantage, okay, black is able to equalize um, in a simplistic manner and you see c5 again bishop c2 takes queen takes and now rook c8 right putting pressure on the position of course there's a threat now of of um uh c takes d d4 knight takes d4 followed by queen takes d4 because this queen is just hanging here this is why we see queen b3 with the attack on the b um seven pawn queen c7 protecting Rook F E one, Rook F D eight, piling up on the um D file. So finally C takes, I takes, and now uh Bishop C five. Knight here, Rook D five, C four, Rook comes back to D seven. Hitting this sensitive point here. Rook E two. This is good for uh black, because uh, white is forced in the passive position. Again, if you can peep the tactics here, pause your video and see uh, what Magnus Carlsen was able to pull uh, out of the hat uh, in this position. Okay, so here Magnus played bishop takes f2 check, exploiting the pin on the dark squares. Rook takes f2, knight e4. Now that you see it, it's real simple, right? Queen d4, queen takes d4, knight f takes d4. Knight takes f2, king takes f2, and now we have, after rook takes c4, this ending of two uh, knights versus uh, rook. And um, this ending is uh, pretty simple because um, black is uh, up two pawns. So um, not only is it it's just not a matter of rook versus knights, but he has two pawns. So this is pretty much a no-brainer. Um, for white here notice how black keeps the the pieces you know makes it hard for the knights to move by attacking the other right um he plays knight takes a7 but rook a5 and he's going to get the, the piece back very difficult for uh shirov to coordinate his pieces and the pawns just come forward, just marching along. And soon Shirov um, had to resign. So we see a nice victory for the black pieces. Again, this Karoslav structure, again, result, resulting mostly in, in, in a passive play uh, from white. But against, eventually, you know, that C5 break comes. Um, that was equalizing the position. Magnus played well. Another attack and play with the white pieces. Uh, so Sergey Rublevsky comes after Magnus. This is the modern uh defense right here. We see this idea with c6, and notice Bishop e2, not Bishop c4 here, or Bishop d3, but Bishop e2 again. This dangerous idea. Rublevsky is also a dangerous attacking player. Bishop f5. Now, castle is played, which is more solid than g4, which is what Anand had played. Okay, just a t uh, 
you know, basically going into caveman mode. Rublevsky plays the more solid um, move castles. Knight f3 again with the same theme we discussed already. Again, you have this Karoslav um, situation. We already know black wants to break here. C5. A3. And basically, black wants to play, uh, excuse me, white wants to play C4 here. Again, this is blitz. So, he's looking at this this idea right here. If he plays C4 right away, knight B4. Um, now, white can play that. So, I don't know if, if um, A3 is necessary here. I don't think it is in this particular instance, but being blitz, he might have just threw that in there. On, on further analysis, though, he probably would just play um, c4 right away. But Rublevsky played a3 first, preventing uh, that move. Bishop e7, and now c4. Knight 5, f6. Knight c3. h6. Bishop f4. And notice the solid position that white has. He's space, space. Right? It's typical uh, like a queen. Like some type of queen's gambit decline. But like I said, it's more, it's more like Carol Khan. Seeing that the e-pawn is uh, missing. Um, and the d-pawn is missing. So very solid position by black. Right? But he has to worry about his space advantage. And white's attacking chances and mobility. All right, typical problems you will run into in a in a Carol Khan, right? Obleski plays d5, and notice that white, excuse me, notice that black uh, again is not able to satisfactory satisfactorily get this moving. He wants to get c5, and but if he plays it here, then d5, with the king in the middle of the board, and he had this Benoni type structure here. Right, this is good. This is good for white. Okay, so the battle of ideas is very important. Castle, there it is. D5. E takes D5. C takes D5. Knight takes D5. Knight takes. C takes. Queen takes uh, with tempo. And now bishop E6. And notice that's going to cost um, a, a, a pawn here. At the bishop E6. Queen takes b7. Knight c5. So, of course, the immediate offer of this, uh, you know, basically stealing and then trading queens. That's like a nightmare. Black tries to make up for the pawn deficit by being active. But after losing the queens, he's just basically a pawn down. And the game is pretty straightforward. Where Magnus is just a pawn down and has no real compensation for it because white is just as uh, active. And Rublevsky just keeps going with the attack. Like he's relentless. He keeps his material. He finally he finally picks up the knight after Magnus uh, blunders blunders the knight here. Better better for Magnus would have been uh, rook d5. But again, these are this is a bliss game. And white is still better, of course, at the rook d5. But here he just kind of he just blunders the piece. Bishop e6 check. And then uh, Rublevsky uh, went on to uh, win that game. Same tournament against Grishchik. With the white pieces, we see this modern defense again. Same variation as Rublevsky. And we see a little twist here. Instead of knight f3, we see knight uh, the g4 this time. Notice, however, that um, an idea of knight g4 is has is, is come to e3. But notice black is uh, white is pursuing the same strategy whereby it's not allowing this trade. Oops, sorry about that. Knight uh, g4, e6, and now c4. So you can see the idea behind putting the bishop at e2 as opposed to um, c4, 
right now this c pawn is not blocked also you can see the idea and benefits of having the bishop also on d3 it prevents the bishop from going to uh f5 however the bishop will go to g4 so you have these these uh battle of ideas constant in the position knight 5 f6 Grishtik doesn't want to trade bishop g6 opting for a super solid position and again you have the same themes right what kind of structure does black have i can hear you out there carol slav there you go and what are the themes you want to try to get c5 break or e5 break in he's three and you can see here what is white strategy white is basically playing this positional game where he has space advantage central uh, pawn preponderance okay and he's basically just trying to squeeze black here develop his pieces behind his um massive pawn front and just slowly slowly grind black uh down bishop b2 rook a d8 queen d2 rook f e8 okay and black is equalized here queen e1 right and that should show you right there when, when black when white has to make a move like that the queen e1 is to get out of out of the potential pin you know that white is okay excuse me black is okay then here magnus plays the move e5 okay now of course you want to make remember you want the break to be c5 or e5 and like i said you would prefer e5 and this is a telltale sign also that black is equalized the fact that black is able to play e5 with no penalty shows that he has a good position so he just um plays d5 what else is he going to play here bishop takes e3 f takes e3 and now knight c5 because of course he's not going to allow um Grishik, uh, to play e4 of course and solidify those pawns even further queen b6 h6 the king moves h2 of course getting out of the pen so perhaps this pawn could advance at some time but notice it's three pieces on e4 break down the center a little bit c takes d5 knight takes d5 knight takes c takes and now knight e4 notice white cannot play e4 like he wants to bishop to c4 now knight d6 initiating the blockade bishop a3 now bishop e4 notice again fighting against this idea of connecting these pawns bishop b4 knight takes c4 b takes c4 queen g6 threatening mate from magnus queen g3 threatening uh, material rook d7 and the game was pretty much equal from here on out And after a few more moves, the players would eventually uh, settle for the draw and shake hands. Nice move by Magnus to um, sacrifice the pawn here to gain the penetration in the position. Of course, he didn't have to do that, but you can see that he was trying to win. If Bishop C5 here then he would allow the rook to double up uh, on the second rank. So he didn't want to do that. So he played c5 and wound up giving up the pawn. This is a good example, ladies and gentlemen. Like if you look at the last five, six moves or so of activity in the position, um, basically um, uh, being good compensation for a material deficit. deficit. Um, Black was so active that he was able to basically squeeze back the pawn from, from Grishchik here. Rook a1, rook e2, and you can see the activity going on, and then eventually fizzles out, you know, in the opposite uh, colored uh, bishop ending. So that ended in the draw. Okay, so the Blitz tournament is over, 2007. We're now in 2008, and this is um, former world champion uh, Veselin uh, Topalov, right? And this is actually a classical game. This is from the Super uh, Grandmaster uh, tournament um, from Morelia and uh, Linares in February of 2008. So Topalov had the black pieces. So here we see an actual serious outing of Alakon defense. And 
We see Topalov playing Bishop D3 here. Again, the, all these all of these moves have separate um ideas. Bishop E2, Bishop D3, and Bishop C4. Here we see Topalov actually just trade off the knight. All the other games we saw uh, to, uh the knight actually retreating in some um, fashion. Castle, G6, Knight D2. Bishop G7, and this, my friends, is just an example of black, excuse me, white just not putting enough pressure on black. Bishop just comes out of the pawn chain, is no problem, and what I think is that Topalov was really caught um, unprepared. He probably was thinking of Rui Lopez, maybe Sicilian, something like that, and all of a sudden, um, Magnus drops his Alicon's defense on him, and he's not ready. So he tries to play solid, but he just ends up super passive. There's C5. Remember, I was telling you about, the, you know, again, this Carol Slav structure. Only difference here is this pawn is not at E6, but Magnus wanted to get the bishop out first. C3, C5, bishop E4, and now there's all types of tactics against the um, uh, D4 square. Since the knight is now pinned. There's e6. Queen b3. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. And now bishop takes d4. Just like that. Super grandmaster. Uh, and Topalov was rated 2780 at the time. Right? So just like that. A super grandmaster is now. Um, just down a pawn. For basically. Basically nothing. Um. Definite oversight here. Um, you might be wondering, well, why can't he just play queen here? Queen takes b7 uh, is possible. Okay, but that is meant by queen uh, a5. And again, black starts working up this initiative. So let's say rook d1 to get out of the way of being captured and to make his own threat here. Well, then just simply rook a b8. Queen is in danger. Queen c6, perhaps rook c8, now what, queen d7, let's say rook c7, queen d6, rook c2 with the threat here, you see this is just a sample of just showing you what kind of trouble that black uh, can cause for white if if white goes and gets greedy and goes after that uh, that um, B pawn with the queen. Black has a lead in development. He's going to win this pawn. The bishop takes here. Whether black plays bishop g5 or he gets slick with the move like uh, b4, this move is going to happen. So to Palov. Play bishop takes d5 first. Queen takes d5. Queen takes d5. E takes d5. So just like that, we're in the end game. And now, I'm sure Topalov, again, maybe being uh, caught off guard a little bit. And combined with his style at the time, which was very dynamic and aggressive. And looking at this position with black having this isolated pawn, it seems that white could get the isolated get the pawn back rather easily right just piling up you know by playing move like rook d1 and just capture you know the bishop has to move and just capturing on d5 and perhaps in his calculations um to paul off might have gotten a little lazy and figured yeah i'll get the pawn back right i'll be active i have my rook also on the open file of course i can just come to the second rank of my opponent put pressure on the b pawn and it seems like it shouldn't be a big deal. But let's see what happened. So first, Topalov goes for rook d1. Very natural. The bishop has to move, right? It moves. Bishop g7. But he cannot capture the pawn. Why is that? He plays king f1. This is the first wake up call. So after rook d5, rook fd8. Now what do you do? Let's say rook takes. Rook takes, right? You threaten with mate, so let's get the bishop out of here. If you play bishop, 
you know, E3. Now you're down a pawn again. You have to move the rook. So let's say rook B1. But now you could just play B6. Why? Because you have back rank issues. See, it starts getting complicated. And those are some variations you can... There's other variations that you can look on your own, but that's just a sample. There's some issues here. And this is why Topalov cannot take the... Um, the pawn instead he had to play king f1 but guess what time and chess is important after king f1 hey rook fd8 bishop g5 rook d7 rook d2 h6 bishop e3 d4 rook d3 rook c8 bishop d2 rook c2 and next thing you know he's just down a pawn not only is he down a pawn Black is more active. So black is up material and more active. You know what that means? Black is almost winning. Because if you're down material, you have to have some compensation. Whether it's activity, right? Some type of a space event, something. White has no compensation. Rook B1. Rook E7. A4. F5. B3. Rook e7, and now Topalov is just trying to hold the position. Bishop e1, king f7. Rook d2, rook c1. Now the bishop is pinned, so king e2, rook b1. Attacking another, the pawn. This move right here, um, rook b1 attacking uh, the b3 pawn forces white's rook into a passive role. King e6. And the king is just going <clears throat> to protect the d pawn, right? Centralize the king, and then also frees up the dark square bishop. King d5, bishop d2. And look how strong the black king is. King e4, f4. And now he has to go back to rook d3. If, and again, this is a classical game. If rook takes g6, you have mate. D3 check. Did you see that? Probably not because you're just passively observing. But yes. It's F4 exclamation mark by Magnus Carlsen. So he had to play Rook D3. Bishop E5 check. F3 check. King D5. And notice how Magnus just has... Topalov's pieces is bottled up. Bishop d6, bishop d2. And notice that this bishop is on a very powerful diagonal here. And if Topalov makes any kind of mistake, for instance, getting this piece pinned, this bishop will be ready to jump right into action. g5, this solidifies, uh, fortifies this pawn and frees this bishop. h takes, h takes, bishop e1, g4. F takes G4 and King E4. Very powerful um, move. And then just simply uh, G5 at the end. And then uh, Topalov resigned right there uh, on the spot. The reason is, is because... Just want to save that. The reason is, is because of rook to e, uh, rook to e1. Rook takes e1 is very powerful because after rook takes e1, the king is drawn away. Right? And then you just take here. And of course, this guy is not going anywhere. So, strong game um, from black, of course, from Magnus. But weak game, weak game conversely from white. This is not the best way demonstration of how to play against uh, Alakon defense. Uh, it's very, very passive play. Again, he probably was caught off guard and tried to play solid and, um, you know, wind up losing. Here's from the uh, Amber Rapid in France. Uh, Sergei Karyakin with the white pieces, who was rated 27-32 at the time, against Carlson with the white pieces, who was 27-33. Again, modern defense. And there's the bishop e2 variation, knight d7. Karyakin plays in a more um, theoretical way. 
not trading off the knights castle bishop g4 so the um the the uh bishop is able to come out before e6 is played this is why my friends you you will see uh sometimes this move h3 being played so again it's the battle of ideas Kariak and just simply castles and um and after bishop g4 h3 so he's like you know he doesn't care about that he has he's like after all i have the bishop here i'll have my space and after e6 again carol slav structure we know the themes we know that black wants to get the c5 move in or e5 but usually it's going to be c5 what that means is that white has to play in a manner that he either prevents that move or he sets up a situation that if the move of the break is achieved that is detrimental to black so let's see how Karyakin plays with this bishop here so first he does c4 knight b6 and now b3 bishop e7 bishop b2 castle knight d2 and here um a5 is played by magnus right notice this bishop here on his diagonal is very powerful putting pressure on the diagonal right if he put if he plays c5 here d takes c5 right b takes c5 and he's just down a pawn So notice how Karyakin is playing in the way to hinder uh, Carlson's plan. So Carlson plays a5 instead. a3, queen c7. So he's just putting a lot of positional pressure on Magnus. He has a space, okay, a pawn, pawn preponderance in the center. And he's just putting his pieces in ideal positions. So that basically black has no counterplay. Rook f e eight, g three, rook a d eight. Again, black is very solid here. You can't just overrun black's position. You just have to play solid. So bishop g two, knight d seven, a lot of maneuvering going on, knight f three, queen b six, touching the b three pawn. So queen c two, knight f eight. And now knight e5. Notice that when the knight moves from d7, the knight just hops into e5, knight g6, and then the knight, knight hops out. So a lot of cat and mouse going on. But again, major principles on display here. Okay, the, the guy with the space does not want to trade. Right? h5, rook ad1, queen c7 from Kariakin. And now f4 from, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, rook a d1, queen c7, and f4 from Kariakin. So it's very difficult to get this break in, right? Bishop d6. Again. c5 and in this case black will probably ignore i'm sorry white would ignore this move he could play knight e5 another idea is just d takes c5 if bishop takes c5 then knight takes c5 queen takes c5 check queen f2 Let's say queen e7, keep an eye on this pawn. Rook. Rook takes. Powerful move f5. And again, even after this, we see black under some considerable, considerable pressure here. With this pawn here, although he does uh, have some counterplay. So, bishop d6, knight e5. Now, if the, now if he tries to trade off, this is bad. Knight e7, 
C5 and notice the space, the crushing uh, space advantage of white here. Just totally shutting down uh, Magnus uh, Carlson's counterplay here. And this is bad. The fact that black does not achieve these, these breaks is bad. He still has some hope here, but his hope is basically to hold, right? His winning chances are really low. Now he's kind of, um, you know, condemned to just trying to hold the position. Of course, he's trying to break down the structure. Now queen e7. And there it goes. Bishop takes f5. E takes. Rook takes. Queen comes out. And it's hard to exploit the white king vulnerability with those heavy pieces in front like that. And Magnus drops back to h7. Rook d f3. Knight c3. And this move right here really... um. It's really the move that kind of like hurt Magnus right here. Um, going for this this tactic. Perhaps F6. Right? Trying to exploit the alignment of the queen here and the rook here is better. Or even rook D7. But I like F6. A little sharp, like sharper. Instead, he plays knight C3 here. And of course, with the idea of rook takes C3 here. However, just simply queen queen c4 double uh, with a double attack on the knight and a triple attack here now. Rook d1, king h2, queen g6, and rook g5. Of course, you're not going to allow yourself to get made it. Queen c2, and now just simply um, rook g2. And that's all she wrote. Black would have to give up the queen there so good game by um by Karyak in there good solid game Karyak and showing how to uh play in a steady um strong manner without being passive and um you can see how you overwhelm the slow in the slow uh manner by using his space uh advantage and uh the power of um those two bishops and just you know, slowly uh, building and building until uh, Black's position cracked. This is from 2014 with the white pieces. This is from the FIDE World Blitz Tournament and French GM Lauren Fresenet, 27-17 versus Carlson, who is at the peak of his rating at this point. 2881 and now he plays this variation I think it's called the Brooklyn variation or something like that instead of your traditional knight d5 so again this blitz Carlson is feeling it and he just plays this game basically he's just gonna say hey I can play whatever I want to play against you and still win and of course, at this point, white is already better, but proving it is a different uh, scenario altogether. And we can see, again, the same structure. So even though the opening looked different, the structure is the same. Carol Slav structure, white. Uh, Black would like to get that c5 break in if he could somehow. Here it's a little prob problematic because you see the rook on this uh, open file. So c5 would not be good here. A couple of pieces come off. And now all Black has to do is deal with this problem of this d-pawn. So he doubles up on the pawn, and now he's going to plan to cut off the queen by playing a move like e5, which he does. He keeps the pressure on the pawn, and now he plans on bringing the king a little closer so that he could snatch the pawn. But here, he doesn't have to. So he just 
wins the pawn unceremoniously uh, from freezing that. And he went on. I'll just show the moves real quick. He just went on to win the game uh, pawn up. Freezing that tries to hold, but with the superior king and his king and pawn and the pawn down, there's nothing he could do. And I'll just show part of a one more game. This is Anand again. This is from the Amber Blindfold. So both players are blindfolded. This is 2008. And this will be the last game here. Again, modern defense. We see Bishop E2, Knight D7. Nice high quality game in the blindfold. Again, white in the Carol Slav um, setup. Excuse me, black with this Carol Slav setup. Again, this is a, a theme you'll see too also with this bishop um, being uh, basically black giving up the bishop here in order to open up this uh, file down here. White is very solid though, so it's hard to really, um, you know, start attacking without justification here. Again, we can see the ultra solid position, white with the space advantage, bishop here. And he just has more options. Black is black is kind of reduced to counterpunching in this um, situation. Black goes for the break. Now, if this move is correct, white um, has basically lost the advantage if this move is correct. But Anand um, simply plays d5. And he's going to put black in the position where he's kind of being penalized for this move. And to me, this move right here, knight b7, it was it was kind of a killer. Um, because it allows queen takes a7 here. Maybe that wasn't so bad, but I think also that simply knight cd7 might have just been better here. But they were blindfolded, so I can't, you know, get crazy. But for Anon to see this right here, very strong play. He goes into this ending. Very powerful play here. And you might be wondering why he can't he just take take this pawn. Right? So C5, let if he takes this pawn here. In amazing calculations if, you know, being blindfolded. But he, he takes his pawn here to simply C takes B6, attacking both rooks. So he has to put that plan on hold. B5, and of course this is coming. So C takes B5, knight takes B5, and now the knight is attacking here and protecting this rook. So rook takes. Bishop to F1 from a non. G5, and now of course, just trade the rooks off. And um, uh, um, Carlson plays knight d8. There's really no good place to uh, put this knight here. Um, say if he tries something else, like knight d5, then just simply bishop a3, attack the rook. If he tried that move, to stop bishop h3, then rook a7, attacking the knight. So the pieces are in a, a bit of a quandary. Bad situation there. And so Magnus gives it up. And he just enters a lost position. And uh, winds up going down in defeat to a non so that concludes our survey of magnus carlson um and his games as black with the alicons defense i hope you enjoyed that um
please support my channel by clicking on those links below. Please hit that thumbs up button so that it will improve the positioning of my videos in the YouTube algorithm. Please donate if you uh, enjoy these videos and if you have any requests, just hit me up in the comment section. I like reading the uh, the comments. And um, so just on to my conclusion, um, notice that a lot of those games were blitz and rapid games. Uh, there's a few classical games. One, uh, not uh, early in Carlson's career in 2007, he was able to draw against Grandmaster Ahaba. And the next one was um, against uh, Veselin Topalov, where it seems like he caught Topalov totally uh, off guard because uh, Topalov played a very passive um, system and wind up uh, paying for it. Um, but the rest of the games were pretty much uh, blitz and... Uh, uh, rapid games where he gave a decent account of himself and you got to see on display the uh, Karoslav structure that you see uh, not only in Alicon's defense but also in um, your Scandinavian opening as well as your uh, Slav defense so that's a good uh, pawn structure to study and become acquainted uh, with um, what do we see on the negative side or and maybe give us some insight to why we don't see uh, Alakon's defense played too much. Well, one of them is this modern uh, line right here. We're black. White doesn't try to set up a four points uh, front, <clears throat> blow black off the board, but simply sticks with the classical two point center. And after, say, this move, C6, he just simply plays uh, Bishop E2. Of course, there are other va variations in the Alicons that Black could play, such as the Albert variation with uh, G6, as opposed to um, C6, as we see here. For instance, uh, G6 uh, is playable. Knight D6, D7 is also playable, but often we see this... Uh, <laughs> the sacrifice here and again these are all ideas that I encourage you to look up yourself if you are interested in Alicon defense um, or check out my videos and playlists um, on Alicon's uh, defense um, but for the most part Magnus has stuck to this modern uh, variation where with a c6 and um, he's done pretty well with it Right, at least in these uh, rapid and blitz games. So it's something that, again, us at lower levels could definitely use. But it seems like the the most, uh, um, you know, the line that gives the puts the most pressure on Black here is definitely this Bishop E2 idea, um, following up with the C4 and basically uh, playing uh, really solid. So games that I would look at if I was white are definitely um, a game against Kariakin. That he, uh, uh, well, Karyakin played as white. That he kind of just kind of crushed him with the space. And, of course, the games that um, Anand uh, played against Magnus Carlsen also. And for the black pieces, I would definitely investigate, look at a game against uh, Veselin Topolov um, and go over uh, that game in a few of his other games. So, again, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it's long, but, hey, it's a compilation video. And, um... Again, I look forward to hearing from you and uh, any suggestions or any other openings of certain grandmasters you might want to see in this format. Let me know and I'll see you guys soon on the next video.